Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our final session for today as part of our first day of National Safety Month videos. Thanks again for joining in this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their day to join these presentations. We understand you guys are busy, especially on a Friday as well, but we really appreciate it. Before we get going, as per my other presentations, I'd just like to thank our National Safety Month sponsors for allowing us to make National Safety Month happen. Uh, we've got a range of prizes with over $10,000 worth of giveaways available throughout the month of October, which we're really pleased to be able to hand out to members and are really thankful for our sponsors. Today's presentations are brought to you by Oz Runways, who's a gold sponsor of National Safety Month and of today's presentations and a long-term sponsor of Safety at RAOs. If you've been in our previous presentations today, you would have heard this already, but there should be a blue chat box on the right-hand side of your screen in the bottom right-hand corner to open up the chat box uh, in the chat panel on the right-hand side if it's not already open. Please throw your questions in there if you've got any for me throughout the presentation, and I'll look to answer those at the end of today. So on that note, I'll get straight into it with my presentation on safety management systems. Now, I obviously didn't set this up well because I've started the day with uh, a reasonably boring topic and um, not finishing the day with the most exciting of topics either. However, a safety management system can be a really important tool to be used within your flight training school and can result in some really positive safety outcomes as well. I just wanted to take the opportunity to present on safety management systems today to provide some tools and tips in relation to how you think about your safety management system and how perhaps you can build on your current safety management system. So schools are likely aware or should be aware that uh, as of 2019, it's requirement of all of our schools to have a safety management system in place within their operations. And we're really happy to have seen the rollout of these systems within our schools. But now what we wanna do is we wanna take those, we wanna make them a valuable tool as part of our operations. We wanna expand on those so that they're more than just a manual that sits on the shelf. So taking a look there, today we're gonna to have a little bit of a look at what is a safety management system a bit of a look at safety culture. We're going to look at the key components and fundamentals of an SMS, some key expectations and considerations, and some of the common issues and observations that we at REOs see uh, that could potentially be addressed or are addressed with safety management systems, or some of the areas of your safety management system that could be uh, updated within your operations. So starting off in basic terms, what is SMS? So ICAO rather defines SMS as a systematic approach to managing safety, including the necessary organizational structures, accountability, responsibility, policies, and procedures. What does an SMS look like though? So the key components of an SMS should outline your organization's commitment to safety. It should identify the roles and responsibilities of safety within your organization. It should identify the actions to take in the event of an emergency. It should have a risk management framework in relation to hazard identification and management. And it should allow the measurement and review of safety performance within your operations. The way I like to look at it is we all think about safety within our operations. Uh, it's an essential part of flying an aircraft. But what the SMS does is it provides some real framework around when are we gonna think, of, uh, think about safety and making sure that there's a process built in to always consider the safety outcomes of the decisions we make and the daily business that we conduct. Often, all of the things within your safety management system are being done anyway. But this is really about creating that framework to ensure that we're not missing anything as we go along. What is an SMS not? 
it's not the need for a whole new department. It needs to be suitable for your operation's size and complexity. We don't want people to think that they need to go out there and hire safety managers and hire a bunch of staff in order to be able to update all of these additional manuals. If you're a small organization with only one aircraft, maybe a couple of instructors, then it should be a very simple document. Um, so you shouldn't need a whole lot of additional resources to make it happen. In saying that, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, it does take time, it does take effort. Uh, that's not to say it's not complicated, um, but the resources, it can be kept simple uh, as per the size of your organization. It's also not a tick box exercise for compliance. And I guess this is the next step in where we want to move with REOs is taking what we put forward in terms of a template and allowing that to become really a functional system within your flight training school. It's not a quick fix for managing safety and it's not a once off fix all solution that's going to ensure everything is safe all the time. It's not a golden bullet, um, but it is a system that hopefully if used properly can really help you improve safety and safety considerations within your school. Practically, what do we want to do with our SMS? We want to identify risks to prevent accidents and incidents from occurring. We want to also potentially minimize the outcome from occurrences if they do happen. And we want to understand safety risks and continue to improve safety. A big part of this is continual improvement and getting that, uh, that manual off the shelf, continuing to evolve that as your business evolves as well. So most of you might be aware that an SMS contains four key elements, and those are the key elements presented on your screen there. Uh, the four main sections are risk management, safety assurance, safety promotion, and a safety policy, uh, which builds in the structure of your SMS. Now, I've taken some of the key points under each of those items and, and put them against the side there. Um, however, please go and have a look at some of the CASA resources, uh, which outline all of the individual elements of the SMS. So when we start off and we look at our safety policy, what we want to see within our policy is we want to see the organization's commitment to safety. What are you committing to? What are the roles and responsibilities within your flight operations? We want to see your emergency response plan. And it's really the documentation that holds the SMS together. In relation to risk management, we want to see a tool that your flight school uses to identify hazards and then to assess and create mitigations for those hazards um, for risk management within your flight operations. Once you've done that, we want to see performance monitoring. We want to see the review of occurrences that take place within your organization. We also want some consideration within your SMS around management of change. And that's a new one for a lot of organizations. And it's one that we do all the time, but having a structured process around management of change can be a really positive uh, outcome in relation to safety. And of course, we wanna see the continuous improvement of the SMS. You can take your hazards and your risks, and we wanna then see that feed into okay, how is our school performing? And are we continually improving to ensure that things are improving all the time? Once you've done all of that, safety promotion is taking those findings and those learnings and building them into your training and education and obviously communicating that uh, amongst your organization, but also out to your schools, um, sorry, rather your students. There's no point having all of this valuable safety information, uh, having worked through a good risk management process, uh, monitor your performance, but then not tell anyone what the risks are and, and what we're doing to manage these things. So I just wanted to touch here a little bit on safety culture. So without a positive safety culture within your organization, uh, it's my opinion that your SMS is not going to function correctly. A, a positive culture really needs to be at the forefront uh, and it needs to start from the top of your organization with your business owner and your CFI, if they are different people, 
and filtered down through the ranks, through your instructors, and also down through into your students. Uh, we're very lucky at REOs that we've got a positive safety culture that's headed from our CEO, uh, Matt Butel, who is very keen on putting safety first uh, and feeds well through all of our staff uh, from the highest level, hopefully through down to our members. So I've put a few questions there just to, to raise some considerations for you and your instructors. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to just be CFIs. Um, the instructors can ask these questions of their school and potentially provide feedback uh, to their CFIs as well as to how culture can be improved for everyone. So what does your safety culture look like within your organisation? Do you find yourself turning a blind eye to certain things that might have a safety outcome? Do your staff feel comfortable raising safety related concerns? What example are you setting for your staff and students? What is the cost to your organization of not managing safety? And again, safety culture starts at the top. I've put there the standard you walk past is the standard you accept in that if you're continually reviewing uh, items in relation to safety and going, ah, oh, it's, it's not that important. You know, I found a defect on the aircraft. Oh, it's not ideal, but you know, just go and do the flight anyway. Or if your instructors feel pressured to continue in an environment where maybe they don't feel comfortable, you're going to see a dramatic breakdown in that safety culture. If people don't feel comfortable to come forward, um, raise concerns that they've got provide feedback as to potentially ways things can be improved, um, then that culture is not going to be as strong as it could be. And that really needs to be cultivated from the top of the organisation. And it should filter right down into your students where somebody can put their hand up and say, look, I, you know, I don't think this is right, or I've got a concern with this um, in relation to something that might be occurring at your flight training school. If you start to get that feedback from your instructors and from your students and they start bringing things to your attention, then that's a good indication that your safety culture is really starting to evolve. So breaking the SMS down into the key elements. Now, element one is the safety policy. So what we want to look at here, it obviously outlines your organization's commitment to safety or the what, the roles and responsibility, so who is responsible for safety, and the pr processes and procedures that follow within that manual. So how do we manage safety? When do we manage safety? How do we build this into our daily operations, into our meetings, and what are the outcomes from that within our organisation? Now, within the template that REL supplied our flight training schools to implement the SMS, uh, this safety policy was basically built into our part one and our part two, which was our aviation safety manual and the emergency response plan. Now, I will say right from the get go that the template that REL's put forward really was a starting point. Um, it does require it. In my opinion, I think we, we require a lot of maturity of this document, and it was really put forward to be a starting point for schools. Now, I think some of the concerns that we potentially run into now is that because schools haven't really built that themselves, they haven't been able to commit to the process as much as maybe what they could have had we have not provided a template, uh, but we hope that that template was a good starting point for our schools. The next stage that we want to see from here is really an adoption of that material and to make it your own. A safety management system can't really be adopted from one organisation to another. There'll be a lot of similarities, yes, but the structures of your organisation, the staff, the complexity, the operating environment that you operate in is going to be different, not only between schools from different parts of Australia, but even potentially different operations on the same airfield. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of a look at some of these things moving forward. Now, once we get past the first element, we, we work into risk management. And what I really wanna do here is start to build in some of the additional features that maybe were a little bit lacking in that initial template and provide some advice as to 
what or start a conversation i guess as to how you are managing these areas within your flight training school and potentially what more you could do there so our second element is risk management which is obviously hazard identification then taking that hazard conducting a risk assessment and determining appropriate outcomes um, from that within your operations and really that needs to be a discussion point it needs to be something that as a school you sit down and really consider what are the risks of my operations and we'll have a look at a few tools that you might be able to use to do that so a few key points i've broken down here and as i've mentioned this will be different for everyone so i don't want to get into the minute details however you should be considering what are your local hazards in terms of your local procedures at your airfield what are your operational hazards specific to your organization and considering human factors is a really good way of breaking down many of these elements in relation to identifying new hazards uh, that might be specific to you so for those who aren't aware um, the shell model is a common model that's used in human factors and it can also be a really good way of assessing risks that you've identified or thinking more broadly about risks for your operation. So if we break down software, we're looking at the processes and procedures. What processes do we have in place to ensure that instructor A does everything the same as instructor B and instructor C? Can we potentially improve those processes in the background to ensure that everybody's singing from the same hymn book? We've also got our hardware, which might relate to the likes of our aircraft, our tools, um, in terms of what we can think about in terms of hazards. We've got the environment, which might relate to our culture in terms of our organization, but also the physical environment. So what are our hazards in relation to terrain in terms of local conditions? Uh, but environment can also come down to when you're operating within an aircraft, uh, noise, vibration, aesthetics of your aircraft. Do you have an aircraft that isn't particularly great for someone who's really tall or someone who's really short? What are those risks that we can break down? And then obviously, liveware to liveware being human interaction. How are you interacting with your staff? How are you interacting with your students? And I think it's a really good model that can be adopted to broaden your thinking in terms of human factors um, and in terms of risk management. And we'll come back to that a little bit in relation to change management uh, in a short while as well. So there's a few ways you can do hazard identification for your local operations. Uh, the first one is really just brainstorming, sitting down with your team. Um, and it might be slightly more difficult for those who are solo operators out there. But just jotting down on a page, what are all the hazards that are specific to my operations? Reviewing uh, your flight training school and RAL's occurrence data is another really good place to start. So throughout National Safety Month, you will have noticed that we've got four kind of key topics that we're really focusing on. Uh, and they are loss of control, alerted see and avoid, and we've got uh, reporting, and we've got maintenance that we're really focusing on uh, as part of National Safety Month. Now, taking some of the key elements and key data from RAL's operations, how are you adopting those within your operations and what thought have you put into these things? Um, the data that we're building and the key occurrence types that we're seeing are not specific to one organization. We're seeing them across the industry. And it's a really good place to start in terms of what uh, are we doing as an organization to ensure that this doesn't happen to, to us, to our instructors, and to our students whilst they're in training and after they've completed training. By doing that, if we can get our schools involved in assessing this, then from a cultural perspective from the top up, we as an organization and as an industry across Australia will start to see improvements in our safety data. Also considering obviously your flight training school processes and procedures, 
what is specific to your operations uh, that might not be generic in terms of actual accident data, but some of the ways that you do business? Are there risks in relation to your local airfield in terms of some of the processes that you specifically follow? Now, this is an area that I want to break down a little bit more in terms of risk management. And the template that REL's put forward was really just a hazard register in terms of what is a hazard uh, and what are we doing about it. But really, in order to properly assess risk within your organization, we need to look at what is the likelihood and the probability, um, sorry, the probability and the severity, the consequence of that event occurring. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to prioritize that list of risks within our organization. From there, we're able to put our focus towards our most important risks uh, within our flight training schools and ensure that the most appropriate uh, amount of attention is starting at our highest risks. So this template here is pulled from the CASA documentation. Now, you can get this information. They've got a really valuable toolkit available on their website at casa.gov.au slash SMS, where you can really get a very basic breakdown for small organizations uh, as to how you can consider risk and how you can work through this process. So you want to start with what is the risk that you're looking at? What can happen and how can this happen? That starts part of that initial brainstorming process. You then want to have a look at what are the existing controls that are in place, and that might be the RAO syllabus, for example, has key points on uh, stalling, uh, which is a contributor to loss of control events. Then you want to break down what is the likelihood and consequence of that event happening, which allows that prioritization and what additional mitigating factors can we put in place to really focus on as part of our operations to bring the risk of that down? Is it at a tolerable risk level right now from that assessment? Are we happy to accept that level of risk based on what we're currently doing? And if the answer to that is no, what more can we do to bring that risk down? Now, if we have an accident occur, there's obviously a number of ways that that impacts our business. It can impact us reputationally, it can impact us financially. If you're without an aircraft for a number of months, then obviously that's going to severely impact you and it can impact your people if it does occur. So this is all about trying to take the knowledge that not only you as an organization are experiencing in terms of some of the events that you may have seen, but taking having a bit of a broader look at the data that Ariel's is breaking down um, and what are we doing to address these key areas of concern in terms of loss of control events, in terms of near miss events? And do we have our maintenance up to date um, so that we're less likely to encounter an engine failure where it may result in one of these later things uh, occurring or, or an accident in an incident? So I don't want to get into the minute details of what can be done in certain environments. That's really up to you as a school to break down how are you going to manage and what more can you do. And um, I think that the previous discussion on loss of control was a perfect example of this. And if you didn't see that video, then please go back. I hope Linda doesn't um, isn't concerned about me raising this. But what I really loved within that conversation was the level of breakdown that, okay, we've had an occurrence happen here. What are we doing to ensure that that doesn't happen again? And there's some key fundamental steps that they put in place to ensure that their training is improved moving forward, which lowers the probability of that risk taking place in the future. Now, whether that was done by following a formal risk assessment process or whether it was just done by sitting around a table, the key thing is that it was done. There's a process that was followed to have this conversation about safety. And that is at the heart of what an SMS is to ensure that this conversation is continued, that it's raised at regular safety meetings in terms of, is there something more that we can do here? Or has this risk changed? Has it become a bigger risk to our organization? Or has it in fact lowered now? And I just wanted to bring up a few examples, really not to 
um, to raise the mitigating factors that I've thrown in this table, because please ignore those, but I want to raise some differences that might be presented by different operation types. So for example, here, uh, I've used the risk of near miss event in the circuit, one of our key focus areas of National Safety Month, and a few different locations uh, where we might have quite a variation in the output or the risk for a particular flight training school. So here I've grabbed three random locations. Um, one of those is Kabulcha, another Jindabyne, and another Bankstown. What are the risks of this occurring to a particular operator at one of these locations? Now, in, when we talk about near miss and when we look at Kabulcha, Kabulcha, we've got a very active local community We've got a bunch of different aircraft types operating. We've got gyrocopters, we've got gliding, we've got light aircraft, and we've got warbirds. Um, a lot of variation in those uh, aircraft types that are functioning there and a lot of activity. So for an operation type at Kabulcha, um, and it is a hotspot for our uh, near-miss events occurring, mm -hmm. the likelihood is going to be higher than, say, Jindabyne. Jindabyne is a small country airfield. There's not a huge amount of activity out there. It's not busy airspace. So the risk controls that someone in Kabulcha might need to put in place for their daily operations is going to be different to someone at Jindabyne. And then on a different stage again, we've got operations at Bankstown where you've got a control tower, you've got parallel runway operations, uh, you've got more IFR and larger traffic occurring. Again, the risks there are going to be significantly different to both Kabulcha and Jindabyne. And it's up to you to consider what are the mitigating factors that I might put in place for my organisation. Now, as I mentioned, these are just brainstorming ideas that I've thrown in this table. But somewhere like Kabulcha, you're going to need to consider what are the processes and operations that I need to put in place when gliding is in progress, for example. Um, do my students know what to do when there's gliding in progress and how does that impact me and my operations uh, in relation to potentially having a near miss event? Somewhere like Jindabyne, there's not a lot of operations, a smaller airfield, a lot more uh, less complex. Um, it might just be reinforcing the basics, providing a handout on standard radio calls and reinforcing standard lookout procedures. And then again at Bankstown, where you've got a control tower, uh, you've got a lot of operations. Now, a control tower can also lower the risk in terms of a near mess event. However, if you've got parallel operations, uh, you're going to really need to enforce uh, the importance of not overshooting the center line when turning on to final to potentially put your aircraft in conflict with another aircraft. And you might also want to consider something like TCAS fitment. Um, to really manage that risk, not only for yourselves, but having visibility of you to other aircraft. So again, this is really just brainstorming, trying to start some thought around some of the things that you might consider and the fact that there are differences between operations, why it's not one size fits all when it comes to an SMS. Moving along to another example, and I've pulled up loss of control. Now, here in relation to loss of control, the same three locations. Um, you've got Kabulcha and, and Bankstown, for example, that might not have any specific uh, increase in likelihood of loss of control. However, when we look at Jindabyne, uh, opposite to our previous example where the risk was lower, Jindabyne, you're flying in mountainous terrain. Uh, there's a lot more considerations in local terrain and local wind impacts. You're going to have updrafts and downdrafts. And this is really something that your students are going to need to be aware of throughout these training processes. So somewhere like Jindabyne, you might need to incorporate ground briefing on mountain flying and density altitude. It's also a high elevation. Um, and what are the effects that these are going to have on your operations for you to, for, to ensure that your students are briefed and appropriately aware of the effects of the terrain in terms of updrafts and downdrafts, turbulence at your local airport, uh, not only during takeoff and landing, but when operating in flight as well. 
The other two really for Caboolture and Bankstown are pretty generic, random thoughts, not specific necessarily to those locations, but might be things that people consider in relation to additional checkpoints in relation to store recovery prior to solo during BFRs or potentially uh, including upset recovery training for instructors. There's so many different tools and uh, I would actually urge that people go back and watch the previous conversation uh, because there was some really fantastic thought there put into what are some of the basic things that can be built into your training to avoid events like loss of control. Again here, I just wanted to raise the differences between different operational types. And then as a final example, which is not specific to something that follows the RAO's syllabus in your standard training, but something that might be specific to a particular business, uh, which reinforces why you need to really do that brainstorming for your own organization, might be, for example, uh, the risk of fuel quality and contamination. And I've just broken down here three different types. Uh, so one organization might use jerry cans and they might use MoGas for their daily flight operations. Another school might have a fuel trailer that sits outside and they fill that with AVCAS. And then finally, uh, you might have another operation who just uses the local fuel bowser at the airport. Again, the risks involved in these three types of fueling procedures are going to result in a different risk to your organization. They're gonna have a different probability of them occurring. The severity might be the same, if you've got contaminated fuel, likely the outcome is, is the same, regardless of which of these tiers that you fall into. However, the probability of it occurring is going to increase or uh, decrease. So for example here, uh, if you fuel your aircraft from jerry cans in your hangar using MoGas, you might need to implement a procedure for the maximum storage time of fuel. Uh, MoGas does degrade very quickly the last thing you want to do is return to your flying operations after being in lockdown from COVID, pull out the jerry cans that have been, been sitting in the hangar for the last three months, put them in the aircraft and go flying. You also might need to put in process some procedures for jerry can handling for your students, for your instructors and for yourselves to ensure that that doesn't become a risk to your organization. Likewise, if you had a fuel trailer, for example, uh, you might need to put a process in place for checking the fuel filter and monitoring the quality of that fuel to ensure that there's no water contamination um, or that it's, there's correct filtering taking place of that fuel. And on another stage, again, if you fill up from your local fuel bowser on your airfield, there should be processes and procedures in place to ensure that the quality of that fuel is higher. It shouldn't have to fall on your back, but of course, there's a mitigating factor in there already, which is a fuel drain after refueling. Standard kind of process that we roll out. So you're not likely to have to build in additional steps and, and phases um, and procedures within your operations, if that's the case. So coming back to that, I really just want to raise some thoughts for, for our instructors and our CFIs out there. What are the local hazards that exist at your aerodrome? Do you have local terrain? Are uh, you high elevation? Do you have sea breezes? Uh, do you have gliding operations? Are you sealed versus grass runways? There's going to be hazards that exist that your students and your instructors need to be aware of. What hazards exist due to the specific operation size and complexity of your organization? Likewise, a one-man band who trains only on the weekends with one instructor uh, is going to be very different to a school that has 15 instructors and 15 aircraft. Uh, a school that's much more complex is going to require a lot more time spent on background processes and procedures to ensure that everything is being done safely. There's a lot more complexity that's built into your operations based on that size. In relation to considering risk management, what are the top occurrence types in RAO's operations and what are you doing to prevent these from happening to you? Now we do publish uh, statistical information on our website at safety.rals.com.au. You will have also seen this built into the License to Learn magazines and obviously the topics of National Safety Month are also built around uh, these key points here. And 
Finally, I just wanted to point out UK CAA Significant 7. Uh, note, Nicholas has just put a link to that in the chat. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, it's a really great way, a great place to start in terms of considering hazards at your, uh, your organisation. Uh, what the UK CAA determined was that pilots are not finding new ways to kill themselves. Um, they are the same types of occurrences that are occurring that result in fatal accidents worldwide. And what they've done is broken these down into seven significant areas. It's a really great place to start in terms of, okay, let's list these things on our hazard register. Let's consider the likelihood um, and the consequences. But then let's break down to what are the current mitigating factors that are currently in place and what more can we do to expand our training to ensure that this doesn't happen to us. These things are happening out there. What can we do to make sure it doesn't happen to us? And that's really the key thing is bringing this back in to be part of our everyday thinking. That's all I want to touch on there for risk management other than uh, to re-emphasize, please go and have a look. Um, CAS is, as I mentioned, they've got some really basic templates, uh, including that uh, that table that I put there. Um, you can take that information, have a basic risk matrix that you use uh, to then be able to assess that. Now, likewise, when you're looking at the likes of a table like that um, and the CASA information does have definitions that they use for the probabilities and the severities there as well. You might have to evolve that for your organization type uh, in terms of what becomes a high, a medium or a low risk. But start with a basic template, build in some of those risks in relation to your organization, and then take that list of, um, of risks and the mitigating factors that you put against them and continue to evolve that bring that out at your quarterly or six monthly safety meeting and say, okay, right, is what we're doing working? What more can we do? And have the risks changed in relation to what we've identified here? And do we need to add anything else to our risk management, uh, our risk matrix? So moving along to the next element uh, after risk management, we want to look at safety assurance. And this is another kind of key area that we often see a few downfalls in relation to how schools manage safety assurance within their operations. Now, that is to ensure safety performance and monitoring and measurement. So like I said, going back, what occurrences have we had in the last quarter or the last six months when we're having our safety meeting? Um, it might not be what have, we have, what, what have we encountered within our operations, and hopefully it's not. Uh, which in some ways makes it more difficult to assess those risks as it compared to a school, uh, as per our previous discussion, that it had a couple of occurrences that really allowed them to break down, okay, what happened there? What went wrong? What can we do to fix that and to improve it to make sure it doesn't happen again? First world experience is obviously the best way to learn from an example. However, we hope that you haven't had those happen to you but we also hope that you'll be able to put the same kind of thought process into that to prevent it from happening to you in the first place. So how is your safety performance within your operations? But also what's the safety performance of REOs? Are there any other key factors that we're pointing out at the moment? And one that's been raised obviously as of late, uh, which is another key focus area of, of National Safety Month is pilot currency. Now, pilot currency results in a lot of things from runway loss of control events um, and, and has a significant impact on safety. But the impacts of COVID-19 have really emphasized uh, the need for currency as we've got a large portion of, of instructors, of students uh, and of pilots returning to flight after potentially extended breaks away. I know at REOs, when COVID started to unfold, this is really where we turned our safety communication and put out our initial license to learn during COVID, where we really focused on building a currency barometer and reinforcing the education and raising the topic so that people are thinking about these when they return back to their flying operations. Now, that's not something that would have ordinarily been at the top of our risk register. Uh, however, due to the local environment, it was something that 
the likelihood of currency related occurrences occurring during COVID went through the roof. So as an organization, we needed to adapt, we needed to put more resources in there. We can't uh, physically sit down and address all of the risks within our operations for all of our schools. But by breaking down the likelihood and consequence, we can build a risk rating that says, okay, we, we really need to focus on these top five things um, in terms of our, our safety focus areas. And that's what we want to see our schools doing and adapting and having these conversations regularly in, uh, in their safety meetings that they should be holding. Internal safety investigation is another one. So obviously there's a reporting requirement to come through to RAOs, but if you have had an occurrence at your local school, what we really want to see when we come back to you after a report is, okay, this has occurred. Uh, it's not great, but what can we do from here? What are you putting in place to ensure that that doesn't happen again? And that comes back again to your risk matrix. What are we doing um, to assess that? to ensure that any occurrences that you've had are considered and, and spoken about. Um, the next one, like I mentioned, is management of change. Now, uh, what I'll mention at the moment, RLs is currently going through the process of evolving our management of change process, and I'm currently in the process of formalising our management of change manual uh, as per compliance requirements for CASA Part 149. We've had a basic change management process in the past, uh, but now under CASA Part 149, it allows us some flexibility, but we really need to put more thought into management of change. Now, this is something that I think if schools don't have a consideration process for management of change in place, then it's really something that you should be thinking about, particularly with significant changes to your organisation. And it doesn't have to be significant changes. If I bring it back in a staff meeting the other day, we were talking about the fact that we've identified uh, a high number of aircraft that are being flown without current registration. Now, what we assessed was had we have put that into a change management process when we stopped sending out aircraft cards, uh, which we did at the start of COVID, uh, it may have had an impact on the data that we're now seeing in terms of um, unregistered aircraft being flown. Now, we could argue it's not our responsibility to hold everyone's hand and to ensure that their aircraft is, is registered prior to flight. That is the pilot and command's responsibility, the operator's responsibility in terms of maintenance and, and making sure the aircraft is compliant. However, could something that we put in place, or in this case, stopped providing to schools, potentially have had an influence on the number of occurrences that are happening? Now, if we put that into place and through a change management process as we did it and put a little bit more consideration into it, there might have been some other things that we can put in place uh, when we took those cards away to enforce that in terms of better education around the hours and maintenance form that can be adopted for your aircraft. Or potentially we could have included a template within the reminder email or the renewal email for your aircraft that allowed you to print out and cut out a, a card and slip it in there anyway that might not be hard plastic but might allow that continuous monitoring to take place now aircraft uh, registration is not necessarily uh, a hazard in terms of increasing aviation risk it is in terms of compliance but it just goes to show the management of change process uh, being followed there now one thing that we have seen in terms of management change uh, and we do regularly see this in occurrences, is where a school might have, for example, bought a new aircraft type online. Um, now, if you've had, in the past, you've had a Jabiru and you've gone to a Foxbat, for example, there's going to be a number of differences in relation to the operations of those two aircraft that are going to introduce new risks to your organisation. Are your instructors current on the aircraft? Are the students current? current on the aircraft? Have you done a bit of a gap analysis to identify what are the operating differences uh, between these two aircraft? And it might not uh, be huge. It might be the difference between a high wing and a low wing. It might be, more importantly, uh, engine failure procedures that are different between one aircraft to another. And what are your students and your instructors going to go back to in terms of that primacy if something were to go wrong? Are they going to be equipped uh, with the background knowledge and the skills 
to ensure that they are now addressing this uh, in relation to a new aircraft type. Something that we've seen in the past as well is potentially the same aircraft type, uh, but an injected engine versus a carbureted engine, and what that means in terms of emergency procedures. Uh, we did at one stage review a flight training organisation where we identified that a school had brought a new aircraft online. It was the same as the other type, um, but there was a difference in terms of the engine in the aircraft. One was carbureted, one was injected. The emergency procedure checklist was different for that aircraft. Um, however, that hadn't been identified and it hadn't been, hadn't been worked through. Um, so there are some key differences when you implement a change within your organisation that just requires a brainstorming session to sit down. Um, they're often things that we do every day anyway, but really sitting down and having a formal process to consider that will ensure that you've given it the time of day to less uh, likely have a uh, an accident as a result of that change. So from there, um, the final point, I guess, in terms of safety assurance is continuous improvement of SMS. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, by providing a template that we put forward, uh, it has been difficult in terms of schools making that their own. Uh, we provided generic material. What we really want to see now is schools taking that manual off the shelf, making sure it's updated, making sure their emergency procedures are up to date, their hazard register is up to date, and that they're considering some of these key elements. Uh, they're bringing that out at their, uh, their quarterly safety meetings or their, their six monthly safety meetings. Um, perhaps if you aren't currently having a safety meeting, it's a, a valuable time to put that in place just to sit down and go, okay, how are we doing? Uh, getting feedback from your instructors, considering your culture, considering any changes and any risks from your organization that might have changed and continually involving uh, evolving and improving that SMS within your organization. We touched on this a little bit before in terms of internal investigation, reviewing incidents and accidents, uh, internal hazard reporting form. So this is another one, and I attended an SMS conference the other day, actually, um, where a flight training school, a fairly large flight training school in Victoria, had a hazard reporting form available to their staff and students. This is something that we would recommend in order to continue to improve that data collection for you as a school uh, in relation to what you're seeing to bring your awareness, not only to bring awareness to it, but to ensure that you're able to focus your attention to that because often we have something occur and we brush it off. Yeah, okay, that happens. Um, if we have a record of that, we can sit down at our safety meeting and go, hang on a second, this hasn't just happened once or twice, this has happened five times. Uh, that's a little bit more of a concern than I thought it was going to be. And if you can get your staff and your students involved in bringing those concerns forward to you, their experiences, what they're seeing, and that can really help you improve that culture, but also improve the outcomes that you're seeing uh, within your SMS as well. And the example that I heard uh, the other day was quite a basic example, um, but it, it was quite effective in that this particular school had had a recording um, that had a form reported noting that that observed a scratch on the propeller. Okay. These things happen. Um, you could consider, okay, you know, stone chip. These things happen, you know. Um, what they did, though, because they had that data, a little while later they had a second report uh, of the same thing happen. And what they did when they broke that down is they identified that the scratch was actually on the same place uh, on that aircraft. Now, uh, what they managed to do was then, okay, let's not just ignore this, let's go and have a look, to see maybe what we can do or, or why this is occurring in the, in the first event. And what they determined was the fact that um, when uh, they had a couple of different parking types and students, when they were using the tow bar to maneuver the aircraft on the ground when it was stopped, um, had accidentally hit the propeller with the tow bar. Seems fairly obvious. 
Um, but because of the position in which the propeller stopped, uh, the students were hitting the propeller and they saw this happen on a, on a couple of occasions. So what the school was able to do was put in process, um, put in place the process where students would dress the prop to ensure that it was horizontal before they moved every aircraft, um, which resulted in uh, an elimination strategy from that occurring. Now, again, a lot of these things, they seem really obvious, they seem really simple, but by taking a really simple step, it might result in less maintenance being required on your aircraft, which results in less costs. Uh, you're not going to have issues in this case, for example, with a damaged prop, which might have other issues uh, later on down the track. So it's really just building in that thought process within your SMS at your organization. In terms of internal investigation, you want to review those risks and your treatments, as mentioned, and review all of the occurrences. Uh, bring them together. There's no point in having these occurrences if you're not going, okay, this, this is what I need to focus on now. And I got a bit of ahead, ahead of myself earlier. Uh, the change management, again, some key areas there in terms of uh, having a process, obviously, to review changes to determine whether they have an impact on safety. Uh, assessing the risks and the implementation of those treatments. And again, human factors is a really good one to consider in terms of when you're making a change. What are the human factor outcomes that are going to take place if I bring on a new aircraft type, for example? Or, uh, for example, if you're an expanding company and another uh, common area that we see with change management falling down is you might be a flight school of one or two instructors and suddenly you get the break uh, you're hiring a couple more instructors you've now instead of got one aircraft you've got two or three aircraft online there's a whole lot of other processes that need to fall into the background there to ensure that you're managing the risks associated with that because as you as a cfi or a business owner start to get busier you've got less time to uh, have supervision over your instructor staff, for example. Uh, and then if you don't have the processes and procedures in place, then you might get drift in terms of their operations um, where cracks start to form. And if you don't have processes that say, this is the way that we do things, then you get that standard drift of, of operations where you start to see issues starting to form. However, if you put this through a change management process, you can consider, for example, we're employing a new staff member. Okay, what, what are the procedural changes in terms of the software that I might have to put in place uh, with this change? What are the, the liveware changes that I need to consider? Uh, do I have a good culture within my organization? How am I going to induct this person so that they're comfortable with how things work here. What training does that person need in relation to our operations? Um, and how is our communication uh, within our organizations? So I think that uh, taking that shell model can be a really simple one just to jog the memory in terms of some other areas that you may not have otherwise thought of. Definitely got well and truly ahead of myself here. Um, we've gone through considerations in terms of bringing a new aircraft online. And again, there, um, some of the considerations in terms of that, that shell model. So uh, a new aircraft type, emergency procedures, student instructor conversion, currency on different types, differences in procedures, difference in maintenance requirements. Uh, by doing this, you can, you can think a little bit broader in terms of what you might initially think of is your maintain a current on the type of aircraft that you're bringing forward um, do they hold the approval to conduct maintenance on your aircraft you might have an l2 who's only approved to operate on a particular type of aircraft due to the limitations that we've set that might then mean oh hang on suddenly i brought this aircraft type online that my l2 can't maintain uh, another good example at the sms conference i used the other day with introducing a new aircraft type was this particular organization required to increase uh, or change their tooling that was required for the maintenance of a particular aircraft type. Then obviously you've got standard handling and performance differences and, and weight and balance differences that might really catch somebody out. And that'll be key for us as an organization when we move 
hopefully towards uh, a weight increase um, in relation to suddenly if we've got somebody who's been operating a fox bat and they go and jump in a 152, what is their mindset going to be in terms of how they believe that that aircraft will perform versus how it will actually perform and how that will potentially result in an accident? And that's one that I've certainly encountered uh, myself with my initial training where I jumped from a Piper Cub that I'd done most of my initial training in into a Cherokee uh, for my commercial training and really didn't put the thought into what those differences are, didn't consider them within my operations. And when I did a touch and go at an airport that I'd done a touch and go at a hundred times before, suddenly I was a whole lot closer to the end trees uh, because I hadn't made that correlation. I hadn't sat down and thought about those differences. Finally, uh, after breaking down change management, we're looking at element four of the SMS. Um, and I don't want to drill down into this too much, but that's just the safety promotion. There's no point in building these processes and procedures and really thinking about safety if that then gets put on a document, on a shelf, and nothing further is done about it. How can you get your staff involved in ensuring uh, that this is an evolving system and, and your students as well? Uh, sitting down with both of them and informing them of these are the, the risks that we're managing within our organisation. What more can we do? What education are we forming? Uh, are we rolling out? Are we uh, improving our um, our training syllabus? Do we want to create a ground briefing on a particular area in relation to then taking that uh, information that we've collected and those risks that we've assessed, pushing that out to ensure that it's being adapted and communicating that safety as well. Do we have a newsletter that we can uh, push out to our students in terms of new risks that we want to consider in terms of what we're doing to address particular uh, areas of focus? I think we've covered most of these areas here. Uh, and to wrap up, I just wanted to quickly focus on what are some of the common issues that we observe uh, in relation to to SMS uh, usage uh, altogether. And um, like I mentioned, I think, you know, we've covered most of these. Some of them is uh, lack of processes and procedures and supervision, particularly for schools who have a number of instructors operating. A lack of policies and procedures it can be really frustrating spending a lot of time writing policies and procedures. And perhaps it's not so important for a one man band or where you've got two people who work closely together all the time who really understand that. But if you're starting to grow, you might need to start putting some thought into, okay, how do I ensure that this quality uh, is maintained for all of my instructors so that I'm comfortable that things are being done properly as we move forward? We often don't see a very good review of uh, the SMS process, and it is new for so many organisations. Um, so this is really where we want to see the adoption and review of these processes and building it part of your normal conversation around safety. The risk management process, and as I mentioned, the templates that we've provided are very basic. And I think we need to actually do a bit of a, um, a review of that to improve those resources. That's why I've referred back to the CASA documentation, which is really fantastic. Um, safety versus commercial pressure. Um, it's it's a massive issue in our industry, uh, not only within flight training, but within GA operators, within smaller family owned or, or smaller organizations that don't have a whole lot of resources. The money doesn't come in unless you conduct that flight. So the key that the, the focus often becomes um, really pushing into we've got to get that flight done. We've got to get that flight done. And what that does is applies pressure to your instructors, to your students, um, that really I can't say, no, I'm not comfortable with this environment. Uh, I don't feel comfortable doing this flight because, you know, the crosswind's a little bit too strong for what I would uh, I'd like to do. How do we continue to build and evolve that to ensure that our culture is one where some can put their hand up and say, you know what, I'm not feeling comfortable. I don't want to go and do this flight. Um, this is one where I see a lot of younger pilots within industry, and this is not specific to flight training, where they have a whole lot of pressure behind them in terms of operating. 
they get to the point where they go, you know what? I'm not enjoying this anymore. This is not where I want to be. Um, I've encountered this myself in terms of charter operations when I was flying in Fiji, where I was being pushed to operate in conditions that should not have been accepted whatsoever. Uh, and the response that I got from my chief pilot was, well, you'll just have to fly it and see how things go. Um, that's not what you want when you're not comfortable in terms of operating in the middle of a thunderstorm in the tropics uh, in a 10-seat aircraft with a bunch of passengers behind you. Uh, it doesn't have to be that complicated, um, but what is that culture and what is that commercial pressure? Are you putting the, uh, the need to conduct that flight ahead of safety? Um, are you continuously brushing things off, not addressing maintenance or defects in relation to your aircraft because oh they're only minor and accepting that and, and what culture is that building rather than saying you know what today we're better off to have to cancel a couple of bookings i'm not going to get that money um but we're going to get this sorted and we're going to come back tomorrow we're going to be safer because of it Finally, there the last two uh, images that I've got down there, the bottom right, change management uh, often overlooked within uh, our operations. And, uh, and finally, where somebody goes through massive growth um, and, um, and doesn't consider the complexity that that adds to their operations. Finally, as I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, there's some fantastic resources on the CASA website, casa.gov.au slash SMS. They've also got their uh, CASA safety management system evaluation tool. Um, have a Google for that document there. Uh, essentially what that breaks down is the key elements and what they're looking for uh, within their organizations that they oversee in terms of SMS. And it'll provide some really valuable guidance that you can take and assess against what you're currently doing to see where you might have some gaps that you can improve on. Um, a really valuable resource tool that I only recently became aware of and one that I'm certainly going to use to consider how Arioz's SMS is functioning and also hopefully continue to uh, improve the tools that we're offering to our flight training schools. So I hope some of that information uh, was informative and it wasn't too boring. Um, I hope there's been some key tips there that you might take away and consider uh, to improve your culture and your SMS and how you're taking that SMS rather than it being a bunch of procedures on a shelf that nobody really uses, pull it off, start that conversation, build that conversation and follow some steps that give some strength uh, and some depth to that conversation that, let's be fair, most schools are already holding those conversations. Um, it's just about that constant improval and an SMS provides the tools to ensure that that's done the same time, uh, the same way every time and continues to be evolved. So thank you very much for those who have tuned in. I'll just see if there's any other Q&A uh, in the comments and if you've got anything, fire it through now before we wrap up. Um, again, go and check out the UK CAA Significant 7 if you haven't seen that already. Um, I would recommend that those seven key points are the perfect seven things to go into your hazard register uh, from the get-go. They are not specific to your operation type. The, uh, the, the steps that you put in place to mitigate them might be, um, but it's a really good starting point uh, in terms of serious accidents uh, and awareness. Does Arios have an SMS? Is it published on the Arios website uh, so far? The discussion has been around SMS for FTS. Thanks, Bill. Um, yes, the, the conversation today has been around trying to give tools uh, for our flight training schools. Arios does have an SMS. You can go and view it on the Arios website. Uh, under our corporate documents, it breaks down these same key elements that we're looking at here. Um, ours is obviously a lot larger than, um, than what we would expect for a flight training school, which should reasonably be be fairly small document uh, with some of these key points. But Ariel's SMS is, is uh, continuously ad adopted and used within our organization as well. Um, we've got obviously some different tools. We've got our OMS that we receive all of our data in from. Uh, and then we take that in terms of safety assurance, in terms of assessing that data and determining what safety promotions, uh, the safety education that we spoke about, will come from that to educate our uh, our members. 
We're also currently in the process, as I mentioned, of uh, updating our uh, change management processes and procedures um, within our organisation so that that is more of a risk-based approach as well. We've obviously got a risk register um, that we have internally, uh, but the same processes and procedures apply on a different scale and with a bit of a different focus than what we expect from our flight training schools. So good question. We certainly do have an SMS internally. And finally, are, what is RLs doing to prevent the coroner from getting control of an accident investigation? The coroner can take years to produce a report and that report need not be made public. Key part of SMS is it has timely reporting of problems that may affect other aircraft waiting years for the coroner to do a report and then not even publishing it is not consistent with SMS principles. Bill, I, I totally agree with you on this point. Um, it's one that I'm constantly trying to work on in the background in terms of how can we improve visibility of particularly our fatal accidents. Um, it's a serious um, matter for us. Um, there's, there's no way of not getting the coroner involved in these accidents. The coroner will always be involved in most cases in, a, in an aviation accident that takes place. And it really comes down to what powers does RELs have in terms of accident investigation, which at the end of the day, we have zero powers. Uh, unlike the ATSB that operate under the TSI Act, uh, who have particular powers who can go in, take control of a site, take ownership of that site, um, and are protected from uh, the outcomes of those investigations. Unfortunately, as a small private organisation, we have no uh, none of these protections and we have none of these rights in terms of um, serious accident investigation. For us, um, and we've been through it a number of times before, we really offer subject matter expertise to the police who is often in charge of these uh, investigations in the event that the ATSB chooses not to investigate, which unfortunately is in most uh, instances due to the nature of our operation type. So for us, we're able to offer SME uh, input to, to assist the police in effect in, in producing a report for the coroner. But because of the fact that Ariel's has no protections uh, under the Act in terms of these outcomes, um, we've really got our hands tied in, in relation to what we can release in terms of findings. That's not particularly comforting in terms of outcomes in education from an SMS perspective, but what I can enforce to you in terms of these things is, uh, is the fact that we do share the data in terms of, we've made it very well aware that over the past five years, um, about 66%, uh, three out of four accidents are rela related to loss of control events. Uh, we've built all of this information into our, our safety reviews and safety outcomes. Um, we understand that that's not uh, as effective as coming out and saying, this is exactly what happened on this day. These are the findings that we had. Uh, but at this stage as an organisation, unfortunately, that's as far as we can go. Um, I'm continuously battling in the background to try and improve that, but um, but that is that is what it is at the moment. But please, if you continue to follow the guidance and the, the material that RLs is putting out, that data is built in there. Our focus areas are around these key areas uh, as per the focus of, of National Safety Month that we're looking at now. And uh, if anyone wants any more uh, in-depth data and breakdown of our statistics and the information that we're seeing as part of our system, then I'm happy to, uh, to send that out as well. I think that answers everyone. Um, gone a little bit over time, but uh, thank you for joining in. I really hope there's been some, uh, some additional tools there to take uh, the template that we provided and expand on that to really build those key principles. If you do have any questions uh, or would like any assistance in relation to your SMS, please reach out to me and the team at safety at Um But go and check out those CASA resources online, some really great data uh, and it's some information and processes and tools that you can use uh, to build that online. So I thank you very much for tuning in. Um, I hope that that has been um, effective in terms of passing on some key points without getting too much into the detail as we close up today. Uh, before I close up, again, I'd like to thank Oz Runways for uh, being a gold sponsor of National Safety Month uh, throughout 
2021. And uh, not only Oz Runways, but all of our sponsors that we've got. Um, please, we'd really appreciate uh, any support in terms of promoting the uh, the conferences that we've got on over the next coming uh, couple of days. Tomorrow's aimed more at our pilots um, in terms of, again, some of the key areas that we've spoken about today. And then Sunday, we're taking more of a look at aircraft maintenance and, uh, and equipment use in aircraft in terms of our range of seminars that we've got on, uh, on Sunday. Uh, thanks to those schools who have promoted that for us. Um, Linda and the guys at Bendigo mentioned that they've got our presentations up on the TV in the main room there and a few people watching. So we really appreciate people tuning in uh, and supporting the resources that we've worked hard to, to build. And um, if you've got any feedback into how we can better run these presentations or what further information you'd like from a safety perspective, please send us an email. Uh, we're always looking for ways to improve our correspondence and our visibility for our instructors particularly because you guys are at the forefront um, of our safety efforts without you guys uh, and the culture that you guys are building within your organisations. Um, we're really not able to, to make anywhere near as much of a difference in relation to safety. So we thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, have a lovely email, uh, evening. Um, we appreciate uh, you taking time out of your day to uh, join us this afternoon. Thank you so much.